Is this the Nazis invading Poland? Is it the Japanese attack on Manchuria? No, this is a United Nations peacekeeping force making war on the men, women, and children of Katanga. What was their crime? Like the 46 other countries that have gained independence since the end of World War II, Katanga, a portion of the Belgian Congo, wanted to be free and independent. But Katanga made the mistake of being pro-Western, pro-Christian, and pro-free enterprise. Why does an organization ostensibly formed for the purpose of keeping peace make war? That is the real story behind the humanitarian mask worn by the United Nations. In a world racked by wars, genocide, famine, and the threat of atomic annihilation, the United Nations represents the symbol of hope for a world that wants to live in peace and harmony. Hope for a time when famine will be conquered and security, justice, dignity, and mercy will replace the sound of soldiers tramping through the streets. To a peace-starved world, the United Nations represents the great peacemaker and the hope of the world, the only alternative to the bomb. The question is, do the facts justify the image? Have our hopes for peace mentally conditioned us so that when the wolf tells us he is a sheep, we see a sheep? Is the threat of the bomb posed to distract our vision from another very real threat, a threat more dangerous than the bomb? Is the UN a hawk, disguised as a dove, making inevitable the very war every one of us prays to avoid? In order to answer these questions rationally, free from prejudice and prior conceptions, we ask you to assess the following facts using intellectual integrity, not emotion. For almost 30 years, Americans have been conditioned to accept the United Nations as humanity's savior. The propaganda barrage began long before the birth of the UN in 1945. So successful has this campaign been that virtually no major American political official of the last decade has dared to challenge the UN for fear of committing political suicide. While most people involved in the campaign to sell the American public on world government were idealistically, if mistakenly motivated, others knew exactly what they were doing. The communists have always viewed world government as a stepping stone to world communism. Joseph Stalin, in his book, Marxism and the National Question, laid down a three-pronged blueprint for bringing the nations into a world government and then using this as a mechanism for Soviet world domination. Stalin's plan was, first, bring all nations together into a single world system of economy. Second, force the advanced countries to pour prolonged financial aid into the underdeveloped countries. Third, to divide the world into regional groups as a transitional stage to establishing a world dictatorship of the proletariat. The American public has been misled into believing that the USSR had to be dragged, kicking and screaming, into the UN, and that she remains against her will because of so-called world opinion. Such, however, is not the case. While Soviet diplomats played hard to get, in order to wring dozens of key concessions from American politicians, the communists throughout the world, and particularly in the United States, were busy propagandizing for the UN. Earl Browder, former head of the U.S. Communist Party, reported in his book, Victory and After, quote, The American communists worked energetically and tirelessly to lay the foundations for the United Nations, which we were sure would come into existence, end quote. Political Affairs is the official monthly publication of the Communist Party and establishes the party line for American communists to follow.
Its April 1945 issue ordered American communists to propagandize for the acceptance of the UN as their key to world victory. The major question for us in connection with the San Francisco Conference is to assure the adherence of the United States to the World Security Organization. Great popular support and enthusiasm for United Nations policies should be built up, well organized, and fully articulate. The opposition must be rendered so impotent that it will be unable to gather any significant support in the Senate against the United Nations Charter and the treaties which will follow. Five months later, the Communists issued a pamphlet entitled The United Nations, which explains what the UN would accomplish for world communism. It declared, first, the veto will protect the USSR from the rest of the world. Second, the UN will frustrate an effective anti-communist foreign policy by the capitalist countries. Third, the UN will eventually bring about the amalgamation of all nations into a single Soviet system. Dozens of defectors from communism who were trained by the Russians in political and psychological warfare have testified that the communists see the UN as a respectable front from which to conduct subversion under the guise of humanitarianism. The Russian political commissars taught their students that those who tried to expose the UN would be put in a defensive position a position of appearing to be against medical care for children and food for starving peoples and in favor of war. Prior to and during World War II, there were for all practical purposes no attempts to keep communists from obtaining jobs in the American government. Did communists in the American government exert any influence on the founding of the United Nations? In 1950, the State Department issued a historical report, Post-War Foreign Policy Preparation 1939-45, through 45, which detailed the policies, documents, and personalities leading to the creation of the United Nations. Of those men credited as instrumental in the creation of the UN, all but a handful have subsequently been proven to have been communists by the overwhelming evidence presented by the FBI, the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee, or in federal court by the Justice Department. Alger Hiss is the most important of those American communists who played the role of midwife at the birth of the UN. Yet Americans have been kept unaware of the crucial role Hiss played. In 1944, Hiss became director of the Office of Special Political Affairs, which had total charge of post-war planning, most of which was directly involved in the organization of the UN. Hiss traveled with Franklin D. Roosevelt to Yalta as Roosevelt's State Department advisor. At Yalta, it was decided to give Russia three votes in the General Assembly to one for the United States. Most Americans still are unaware that Belarusia and the Ukraine each were given a vote in the UN. This would have been tantamount to giving one vote each to New York and California. This was executive secretary of the Dumbarton Oaks Conference, at which key decisions on the UN Charter were made. This conference was so secret that the press was excluded from the hearings. When the nations of the world gathered at San Francisco in 1945 for the official founding of the UN, Hiss was there in the key position of acting Secretary General. UN apologists attempt to pass off Hiss's strategic position in guiding the conference by maintaining that the job of the Secretary General was merely to assign rooms. But, as Time magazine stated at the time, quote, Alger Hiss will be an important figure there. As Secretary General managing the agenda, he will have a lot to say behind the scenes about who gets the breaks, end quote. Hiss also served on the steering and executive committees which were charged with the responsibility of actually writing the UN Charter. When the conference was concluded, Alger Hiss personally flew to Washington, D.C. with the UN Charter. Hiss had played such an extensive and critical role at all levels in planning the UN that he was selected by the State Department as the man best qualified to present the UN Charter for the Senate's approval. <laughs>
Hiss then served as the Secretary General of the UN until Trigvi Lee was formally elected. From its conception, through the behind-the-scenes agreements at Dumbarton Oaks and Yalta, to its birth at San Francisco, Hiss was instrumental at the policy-making level. And that is why the United Nations is justifiably called the house that Hiss built. Later, Alger Hiss was convicted of perjury for lying about his activities as a Soviet spy. The only reason he was not tried for treason was because the statute of limitations had expired. Since his trial, a parade of former communists who worked with Hiss in the Communist Party have added to the mountain of evidence already presented by the FBI. Another communist agent who played a key role in setting up the UN was Harry Dexter White, who had complete control over foreign affairs in the Treasury Department. White chaired the committee that established the United Nations multi-billion dollar International Monetary Fund, which carries out point two of Stalin's program for communist victory by using U.S. taxpayers' money to build socialism in underdeveloped countries. Other key communists in the U.S. State Department active in establishing the U.N. include Lawrence Duggan, head of the Latin American Division, Noel Field, a high official in the Western European Division, Henry Julian Wadley in the Trade Agreements Division, and John Carter Vincent, chief of the Chinese Affairs Division. Communist David Weintraub held a key position in the Office of Foreign Relief and Rehabilitation Operations. Communist Harold Glasser was the Treasury Department's spokesman in United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. Communist Irving Kaplan was a top official in the UN Office of the Assistant Secretary General for Economic Affairs. Communist Laughlin Curry was a personal assistant and advisor to President Roosevelt and played an instrumental role in formulating U.S. policy that led to the creation of the U.N. All of these founding fathers of the United Nations were later proven by the United States government to be Soviet spies. These men, supposedly representing the United States at the creation of the U.N., were actually representing Soviet Russia. Even the U.N. symbol was designed under the direct supervision of a secret communist, Carl Aldo Marzani, working in the American Office of Strategic Services. Notice the similarity between the U.N. symbol and the Russian national symbol. Coincidence? U.N. apologists maintain that communists do not control the U.N., since there are only about a dozen communist bloc nations. This ignores the fact that the balance of power now lies in the Afro-Asian bloc countries, which are almost universally socialist and usually vote with the communists. But equally as important as the makeup of the General Assembly is the composition of the huge bureaucracy that carries out the policies of the UN. The appointment of the original American contingent to the UN bureaucracy was greatly influenced by Soviet agent Alger Hiss. A Senate Internal Security Subcommittee investigation showed that Hiss was instrumental in the employment of 494 persons by the United Nations. During the Korean War, a New York grand jury uncovered enormous evidence of communist penetrations into the American staff of the UN. The grand jury report stated in part, This jury must, as a duty to the people of the United States, advise the court that startling evidence has disclosed infiltration into the UN of an overwhelmingly large group of disloyal United States citizens, many of whom are closely associated with the international communist movement. Only a few were removed, but they were later reinstated with full retroactive pay, as it is not a crime for a communist to be employed by the world organization. If communists can so thoroughly penetrate the U.S. contingent to the U.N., imagine how easily a communist can work into the staffs of other countries, many of which are already socialist. Communists in the U.N. administrative force work together regardless of their nationality, promoting each other into strategic positions of importance, 
Because of this organized conspiracy, the communists have power and influence far beyond their numbers to use UN policies for the advancement of communism. Another function communist administrators perform is espionage. According to Trigvi Lee, the first secretary general, it was the Russians who insisted that the UN be headquartered in the United States. FBI director J. Edgar Hoover has stated that 70 to 80 percent of the Iron Curtain diplomats in this country, quote, have some type of espionage assignment, unquote. They are not just clerks, but dedicated agents. Hundreds of these highly trained espionage agents have been apprehended by the FBI, but since they have diplomatic immunity, their punishment is merely to be sent home, only to be replaced by another highly trained spy. Besides communist control of the bureaucracy, the top UN administrative personalities have very questionable backgrounds, Backgrounds conveniently ignored by the mass media. Utant of Burma, the Secretary General of the UN, is constantly extolled as the model neutral. The fact that he is a self-professed Marxist is ignored. How can a Marxist, philosophically dedicated to the destruction of capitalism, be neutral? UN critics point out that Taunt is seldom neutral, supporting the communists or neutralizing their opposition at every turn. Whether it be the condemning of U.S. nuclear testing while saying nothing of Russia's testing, or championing Red China's admission to the U.N., or watering down a weak resolution condemning the Soviet slaughter of freedom-seeking Hungarians. Utant has two principal assistants who work as undersecretaries. The first, Alexei Nesterenko, is a Russian communist. Tant's other assistant is Ralph Bunch of the United States. Bunch has remained immune from criticism because he is a Negro. And yet the complaints against Bunch's record have nothing to do with his race. Whenever his long and extensive pro-communist background is mentioned, his detractors are invariably attacked as vicious racists. Attention is switched away from Bunch to those who are attempting to reveal his communist activities. Bunch was a contributing editor to Science and Society magazine, lending his name and prestige, even though the communists openly stated that the magazine was designed, quote, to help Marxward moving students and intellectuals to come closer to Marxism-Leninism, to bring communist thought into academic circles, end quote. Bunch, who had been an assistant to Alger Hiss, was identified under oath as a member of the Communist Party by both Manning Johnson and Leonard Patterson before a governmental loyalty board. Patterson and Johnson, both Negroes, had been trained in Moscow but defected from the party when they became aware the communists only intended to enslave the Negro here in America. Ralph Bunch is the man who, along with Nestorenko, a Russian communist, and Tant, a self-professed Marxist, runs the Secretariat of the UN. The most important and strategic position within the framework of the UN is that of the Undersecretary General for Political and Security Council Affairs, Yet most Americans have never even heard of the position. He has three main responsibilities. First, control of all military and police functions authorized by the Security Council. Second, supervision of all disarmament activities. Third, control of all atomic energy entrusted to the UN. Should the U.S. ever turn over its atomic weapons to the U.N., this position would have the power of life and death over every American. It is crucially important to know that this position has always been held by a communist since the inception of the U.N. in 1945. Trigvi Lee, the first secretary general, in his book, In the Cause of Peace, details his astonishment that the U.S. would ever enter into such an agreement. He wrote, 
Mr. Vyshinsky was the first to inform me of an understanding which the Big Five had reached on the appointment of a Soviet national as Assistant Secretary General for Political and Security Council Affairs. Mr. Statinius confirmed to me that he had agreed with the Soviet delegation in the matter. The preservation of international peace and security was the organization's highest responsibility, and it was to entrust the direction of the Secretariat's department most concerned with this to a Soviet national that the Americans had agreed." End quote. Considering the makeup of those Americans who created the UN, it is not surprising that such an agreement was made. The surprising thing is that nothing has been done about it and that the mass media has neglected to inform the American people of this crucial fact. UN apologists incredibly attempt to shrug off the fact that history's greatest mass murderers control the military arm of the UN by pointing out communist control is traditional, just as the US traditionally heads other positions. When the UN was established in 1945, it was heralded with an unprecedented propaganda barrage as the guarantor of peace throughout the world. Prior to the establishment of the so-called peace organization, Russia had swallowed up Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. But the major acts of communist aggression have occurred since the establishment of this peace organization. Since the founding of the UN, the communists have conquered the Sakhalin and Kuril Islands, Outer Mongolia, Albania, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, Czechoslovakia, North Korea, North Vietnam, Manchuria, East Germany, China, Tibet, Northern Provinces of India, Northern Laos, Cuba, and Zanzibar. Since the establishment of the peace organization, one billion people have been enslaved, tens of millions butchered, and yet more millions thrown into slave labor camps. What has the peace organization done about this aggression, which far surpasses that of even Hitler? What did the UN do when the Hungarians revolted against their slave masters and were brutally crushed? What does the UN do today while the communists murder Vietnamese peasants or slaughter freedom-seeking Germans on the Berlin Wall? Nothing. The peace organization does nothing. And how can it? Would you have an effective police department if the mafia had control? This is the growth of communism 20 years after the formation of the peace organization. If the UN does not directly participate in communist aggression, it preserves the Soviet prison house of nations by doing nothing. The UN protects the communists' conquests by deflecting attention from Hungary, Cuba, and the Berlin Wall and toward the underdeveloped countries. The UN never talks of communist atrocities, only of Western colonialism. Pro-Western countries are censored for restrictive voting requirements, but nothing is said concerning the fact that no communist country has ever held a free election. The H-bomb threat is then used to mesmerize the American people while the communists carve up the world piece by piece. UN apologists point to Korea as the UN's supreme achievement. In 1950, when communist North Korea attacked South Korea, the UN voted to intervene. The American public has been convinced that it was a fantastic stroke of good fortune that the Russians were, at the time, boycotting UN meetings and were not there to veto intervention. Since the North Koreans were Kremlin puppets, acting under Kremlin orders, and their armies were Soviet-supplied and equipped, the idea that the attack on South Korea caught the Russians by surprise is extremely naive. The long-run plans of the communists were aided in many ways by the precedents set by UN intervention. It was the old and successful communist strategy of one step backward and two steps forward. These precedents include, first, it was the only time American troops have fought a war they were not allowed to win. 
Second, American troops fought under U.N. command, not U.S. Third, Americans lost prestige around the world and became the paper tiger that couldn't defeat tiny North Korea. And fourth, the aggressors were treated as equals with the victims and were not punished. The most important precedent, however, was the bypassing of the Security Council where the U.S. has a veto. Now the veto protection no longer exists. Since the Russians were absent from the Security Council, it was decided to throw the Korean question into the General Assembly where no veto exists. A UN-published pamphlet glowingly describes this dangerous change in UN procedure. Quote, If, due to a veto, the Security Council fails to act in a case of military crisis, the General Assembly can hold emergency sessions to take up the matter. In such a case, the General Assembly can call on member nations to make available their armed forces for whatever military action the General Assembly may recommend, end quote. Former Secretary General Trigby Lee described this revolutionary change, quote, The Assembly engineered a profound shift of emergency power from the veto-ridden Security Council to the veto-less General Assembly, a shift the full potentialities of which have still to be realized, end quote. The Korean fiasco, which cost the U.S. 152,000 casualties and billions of dollars, was later the subject of congressional testimony by U.S. military commanders. General James Van Fleet stated, If we must again send our sons abroad to fight for freedom, I hope they go unshackled, that no appeaser's chains bind their arms behind their backs. General Mark Clark testified, in carrying out the instructions of my government, I gained the unenviable distinction of being the first U.S. Army commander in history to sign an armistice without victory. According to its apologists, this was the U.N.'s finest hour. What is the communist strategy for obtaining the avowed goal of world conquest through world government? Most Americans take the attitude that since the U.N. has not as yet directly affected their daily lives, it must not be a threat. Americans are not aware that the Kremlin strategy is to guard against alarming the public, lest it become aware of the path down which we are being led to the final victory of communism. This victory depends on the American public remaining apathetic, soothed by the syrupy propaganda that the UN exists only to promote peace and help starving children. Meanwhile, the communists weave their entangling web one strand at a time, content temporarily to have the United States pour out its wealth to solidify socialistic governments around the world. As year by year, the UN admits more avowedly socialist communist countries. Americans are unconcerned about the tide of anti-Americanism in the UN, believing that the Constitution and Bill of Rights protect their freedoms from those who covet our wealth, but are unwilling to adopt the free enterprise system that produces it. The public is unaware that a treaty, such as the UN Charter, supersedes our Constitution. Former Secretary of State John Foster Dulles stated, quote, Treaties make international law and also they make domestic law. Under our Constitution, treaties become the supreme law of the land. Treaty law can override the Constitution." End quote. A Supreme Court decision has ruled that this applies also to executive orders, personal agreements, and international compacts entered into by the President and never even seen by Congress. When will the communists close the trap? When we no longer have the military capability to defend ourselves and are no longer able to extricate America from the UN's grasp. The communists want America intact, not in ashes. They want to capture our tremendous productive capacity and skilled workforce to support their world slave empire. 
But they know they can never do this so long as America possesses an independent, technologically superior defense force. Naturally, the Communists want us to disarm and to turn our military capabilities over to the UN, where they will be under the control of the Undersecretary for Political and Security Council Affairs, the office always held by a Communist. Khrushchev stated, The slogan for the struggle for peace must not contradict the slogan for the struggle for communism. The struggle for disarmament is an effective struggle against imperialism for restricting its military potentialities. In December 1960, at a Moscow meeting of communist parties from all over the world, communist leaders declared that an active, determined communist struggle must be waged to, quote, force the imperialists into an agreement on general disarmament, end quote. In September 1961, the United States State Department issued its official program for disarmament in document 7277, entitled Freedom from War, the United States Program for General and Complete Disarmament, which presents the formula for gradually turning the U.S. military force over to the U.N. It declares, quote, no state would have a military power to challenge the progressively strengthened UN Peace Force, end quote. The U.S. will finance the UN Peace Force so that the politicians will still have a $52 billion defense budget with which to buy votes, but the military equipment will go to the UN. State Department Policy Chairman Walt Rostow elaborated, it is a legitimate American national objective to remove from all nations, including the United States, the right to use substantial military force to pursue their own interests. Since this residual right is the root of national sovereignty, it is therefore an American interest to see an end to nationhood, as it has been historically defined. The same month that the State Department submitted the U.S. proposal for complete disarmament to the U.N., Congress passed the necessary legislation establishing the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency to carry out our disarmament by entering into agreements without congressional consent. The Moscow Test Ban Treaty committed us to carry out this plan to put American military might under the command of a communist, and the Geneva meetings are taking place to work out the details. Many maintain that the principles of American independence were fine for 1776, but that in this day of the H-bomb, we must surrender our sovereignty and military forces to the communist-dominated UN. We have already surrendered our sovereignty in principle, and the communists are now only waiting to get full military control before they move in for the kill. The daily pacifiers of the mass media can be relied on to protect the UN buildup and distract the American public from the real plans of the communists. The material in this film is cold, hard fact. While the truth is unpleasant, the documentation was taken from UN, State Department, Congressional, and Communist sources. The proof is readily available for all those who are concerned and intellectually honest. Some will prefer to sneer at the reality, lest they be forced to admit that they have been misled. And many will be distracted from the facts by shrieking attacks on those who expose the UN. Your attention will be drawn to the food and medicine for innocent children and diverted from communist control of the UN military function. You can swallow the comfortable propaganda image. You can accept the myth and ignore the reality. You can do it right up to the time you become a slave. The time to act is now while there still is time. What can you do? First, inform yourself. Read The Fearful Master, the exhaustively documented story of the UN. Get The Fearful Master into your local schools and public libraries. Ask your local school board to spend one-twentieth as much money on materials exposing the UN as it does on promoting the UN. 
Show this film to friends, neighbors, business colleagues, service clubs, church groups, and in the schools. Turn UN Day in your community into United States Day. Without United States support, the communist strategy for victory through world government will fail. Ask your congressman to cut off funds to the UN and get us out. Peace, freedom, and prosperity depend on your taking an active part in their preservation. They cannot be attained by collaborating with evil men bent on conquering the world. Would you take in a crook as a business partner? Would you invite the mafia into the police department? Then it should be obvious that the UN, far from bringing peace, can only bring us war and slavery. The choice is yours. One nation under God or one world under tyranny.